Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring, Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. From our studios in California, we bring you this special program of the Voice of Prophecy. You will hear the music of the King's Heralds, Del Delker and Brad Braley. This is HMS Richards, your Voice of Prophecy speaker. Father, in this very important service today, we pray that thou bless everyone who hears this message. Support us, we pray, here in the studio, and greatly bless those who listen to the music and the message. Father, in such an important day for the voice of prophecy, we pray that thou wilt lead us all, and especially spiritually prepare us for thy kingdom to come. In Jesus' name. Scanning the sky 
trumpet and shout from the heavens descending. The sky's ageless silence he'll shatter that day. We'll rise up to meet him, our voices all blend. Saturday nights, the streets downtown in many places are full of people. Some shopping, others are on the way to places of amusement. Some are just joining in the excitement of the last night of the week. Wages have been paid, now they're being spent. It's the end of the cycle of seven days. It winds up a period of time known around the world. It's the big night in town. It is Saturday night. But we take it as a symbol of something bigger as a picture of a day that's coming, and we shall call it the world's last Saturday night. According to Scripture, there is to be an end to this age, this dispensation. The times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, and the day of the Lord will begin. The coming of this day may seem far off and unreal, but it was real to the view of the writers of the inspired word. Do you remember how endless a year seemed when you were a child? Someone would say that Christmas was coming or that your birthday was coming. And it seemed like an endless wait ahead. But they always came, and they've kept on coming with increasing tempo. So, too, the end of the age, the end of the world, as our version puts it, will come, and it will be the end of man's planning and devising, the end of his unhappy history as apparent director of world affairs, the end of man's godless, self-seeking life, the end also of his gospel opportunity, the beginning of judgment. It will be the end of careless, heedless, indifferent worldly life, the end of the money-mad, selfish, pitiful race for pleasure. We have a picture of the human scene in what the Bible calls the last days as given by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 1, beginning. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. These latter days reach right up to the last day of this dispensation, which is ended by the return of Christ. Will anyone, Jew or Gentile, be converted and saved after this great event? When is recorded in Matthew 24, 3, the disciples came to Jesus and inquired, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? His very first words were, Take heed that no man deceive you. And we believe that after hearing the scriptural statements, which will be read on this broadcast, you will agree that one of the greatest deceptions of this age is the idea that after the second coming of Christ, millions of both Jews and Gentiles will find pardon and salvation. Such teaching is calculated to put a damper on the worldwide preaching of the gospel in this generation. For the conscious or unconscious argument is this. If the gospel is to go to the multitudes again after the second coming of Christ, why sacrifice labor and money for its completion now? Why do that? That's the question that naturally comes. But what does the Bible say about it? Well, friends, when he comes, something's going to happen. When the day of the Lord comes as a thief, unexpectedly, 
millions will be surprised and unready, and they'll begin to pray. But these prayers will be prayers of despair. The old are going to pray. The young are going to pray. Rich men, poor men will pray. Lost church members are going to pray. The infidels will pray. Everybody will pray, kneeling on the streets, public highways, everywhere. As they feel the earth shaking and hear the trumpet sounding in the clouds, they will surge forth in consternation from crowded theaters, nightclubs, palatial residences, costly apartments, business houses, everywhere. They'll pray when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. We read of that day of unanswered prayer in Revelation 6.14. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island removed out of their places. And the kings of the earth, the great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, bondmen, every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? People who would not pray to God now pray to rocks and to mountains. George Stewart, the famous southern preacher, used to tell the story of a man who went down the Tennessee River for a swim with two of his promising boys. He said, now boys, we'll swim together. And out they went, and at last they came to the main current of the river. Then he said, I think this is far enough. We'd better start back. But the current was too strong, the distance too great, and his two boys went down. Only by supreme effort was the father himself able to reach the shore. In agony he cried, my boys are gone. My boys are gone. I swam out too far with my boys. Fathers, mothers, are you venturing out too far into the current of worldliness? How will you pray in that day that's coming? Come back, father. Come back, mother. Come back to God, to the Bible, to truth, to the church. Come back and bring your children with you. When the day of the Lord comes and the sad prayer meeting starts, it'll be too late then to turn back to God. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, of trouble, distress, wasteness, and desolation. The day of the trumpet, an alarm against the fenced cities. And I will bring distress upon men, the Lord says, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Zephaniah, the first chapter. Then to those who are deceived into trusting in a second chance, the prophet, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says in the second chapter, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. There's no teaching here of a second chance. For the living wicked after that day will have no chance. This divine decree which will settle forever the destiny of all mankind is recorded for us as a warning in Revelation 22:10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Here we read in plain language that when the Lord comes, the destiny of every man is unchangeably fixed. We are told here that the righteous and holy man will re remain holy and righteous. The Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. This seals the destiny of men. One day while on the train leaving Chicago for California, we stopped briefly at a suburban station. Just as the train started on again, an open-top automobile could be seen in the distance coming at great speed with a man standing up behind the driver, waving his hat and evidently trying to get the train to stop. It was too late. 
The speed of the train continued to increase as it sped on toward the west. That man was just one minute late. He might as well have been an hour or a day. He was too late for that train. No one who ever lived was more opposed to the teaching of another chance for salvation after Christ's second coming than our Lord himself. And no one ever condemned it more strongly than he. He's our example, he's our teacher, and here's what he says in Luke 12. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Do you notice what he says? He plainly states, as a servant who is not ready for his Lord to come, will share the portion of the unbelievers. Jesus uses the example of the destruction of the wicked at the time of the flood and of the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as a warning to those who will be unprepared when the Lord comes. You'll find it in Luke, the 17th chapter. Likewise also as it was, he says, in the days of Noah, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Same as the days of Lot, he says. They built it, planted, carried on business and social life. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Luke 17. Friends, should we appeal to people to prepare and be ready for the Lord's coming, lest they go into some other place for another chance? No, indeed, lest they be lost and lost forever. Whenever the Bible mentions the wicked in connection with our Lord's return, it always says that their opportunity for salvation closes that event. Read 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10, and you'll find it there, plain and clear. There will be classes of people, yes, two classes when Christ comes, the saved and the lost. Those that know not God and obey not the gospel and his saints. In which class will we be found? It's in this life, friends, that we have the one golden opportunity. So, friend, I plead with you, listen to the call today. Our Savior's work is a faithful high priest who can be touched with all the feelings of our infirmities will cease before he returns in glory. He was here as a Savior. He died on the cross for us. He paid the penalty for all our sins, and now he is our friend and high priest in heaven there before God for us. And he leaves his mediatorial work and comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's there in the heavenly temple, the heavenly sanctuary now, pleading our case. The apostle John saw him there in Revelation, the first chapter, he saw Jesus there standing before God as our mediator and friend. In Hebrews 8, the first verse, we read, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum of the chief point. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. This proves that today Jesus is a priest. And as long as he remains a priest, there is access to God for the sinner, as we read in Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. My friends, he's making this intercession for us now. Will you not turn to him, backslider, cold, indifferent Christian, Sinner ne who has never taken a stand for Christ, will you not do so today? Next we see in Revelation 14, 14, a change. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. The crown means he's a king. The sickle means the harvest, and the harvest is the end of the world, according to the 13th chapter of Matthew. This time he comes as king not to sow the seeds of the gospel, but to reap the harvest of the earth. His fan is in his hand, we read in Revelation 3, 12, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner, 
but he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Does that mean a second chance for the wicked? God forbid that the voice of prophecy shall ever give utterance to the dangerous and deceptive teachings of a second chance for those who are neglecting to prepare to meet their God. Our message is, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. I appeal to you, all who hear this message today, give your hearts anew to Christ. Go all the way, receive his word. Surrender your soul to him. Give him your sins. Accept the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to lead you and guide you, to regenerate you and prepare you for the coming of the Lord, that you may have a home with him forever and ever. sisters and friends, here's a very special personal word to each one of you. First, a big thank you for the offering you gave us last year. In our camp meeting tour this year, we've met so many people who are rejoicing in fellowship with the message now through the work of the Voice of Prophecy. Dozens, yes, hundreds of them came to us this year and told us that they had been brought to Christ in the message through the Voice of Prophecy. We're trying something new now, a series of daily Voice of Prophecy programs like a complete evangelistic campaign. Four stations in Washington carry it. In a few days, we'll begin an in-person preaching service to reach some of the people who hear this Monday through Saturday program on seven stations in Georgia. Please pray for our group and our attempt to evangelize the dark counties. There's never been a time in history of the Voice of Prophecy when so many good stations are open to our program, but funds are not available to buy some of them. For example, available now, and we need Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, Wilmington, North Carolina, Dodge City, Kansas, one in Alaska, and many others. Pray with us that the station in Monaco over in Europe will be willing to sell time for our Spanish broadcast into Spain. This is the 20th anniversary, by the way, of our Spanish broadcast, and we have a brand new Bible course in Spanish called Treasures of Life. We're happy to have right now a large influx, by the way, of new enrollments in all our Bible schools, but increased rates have raised our average monthly postage bill to $11,500. But in spite of increased costs, on every hand, we must go forward. Soon we'll be introducing a brand new health course written by your radio doctor, Dr. Clifford Anderson. 
Our offering goal for this year is $250,000. But you know, friends, even double this amount would not be enough to care for the work we ought to be doing. Every day our money is worth less and less. You know that. May God help us this day to have the faith and generous hearts to double our gifts. We pledge to do our very best to stretch every dollar to the limit. Thank you, friends, for your prayers and for your fine support. Together, let us send his word through the air to all the peoples of the world. In no other way will a dollar go farther in carrying the message of salvation to earth's remotest bounds. And so we plead with everyone today, please pray, ask God what to do. And then whatever it is, large or small, follow the guidance of his Holy Spirit in the offering today. And we'll be praying for you here as you pray for us and work with us there. God bless you, everyone, in this offering service today. Have faith in God, the Holy Scriptures say. Have faith in God, no longer now delay. Have faith in God. Support his work today. Have faith, dear friends, in God. <laughs>